Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on October 12th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar, which happens to line up with the second of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it according to the scriptures and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all those related texts. And we are continuing today in our readings of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. Last week we covered the deathbed testament, if you will, of Yahusuf, the tenth son of Yaakov, with Rachel, and he was the first one to pass away at 110 years old. The second here is Shimon. And before we get started real quick, in the telegram, in the sharing his word telegram, I put in the information that you can read from the book of Yobelim and the information that you can derive from this book here on when they were born and when they died. There is some inconsistencies with the numbers, even between the two here, and even within the text of the book of Yobelim or Jubilees itself, there's a few inconsistencies with the numbers. I'm still looking into those. This is things that other men have also talked about. You can see it in the... Uh, footnotes here as we're going perhaps but it isn't solidified perfectly the dates and the numbers compare very well but the, you'll see at the end there it, with our purposes we can pretty much track down when and the order they died though if not getting the exact years in line with each other for all the, the manuscripts if that makes sense to you and father willing we will be able to learn that truth eventually, but I don't have that information now. However, Simon or Shimon, Simeon here, the ones who hear, believe, and do, is the second son to pass away. And you can hear because he died in the 120th year of his life, at which time Yahusif, his brother, died. And it was in the same year. When you add them up, it would both be the year 2244. That's part of the discrepancies, though. In the Book of Jubilees, it will tell you that Yahusuf lived 110 years, but it has the years from his birth to death to be only 108. So, either way, it says, The testament of Shimon, or Simeon, the second son of Jacob and Leah. The copy of the words of Shimon, the things which he spake, to his sons before he died in the hundred and twentieth year of his life, at which time Yahusuf his brother died. For when Shimon was sick, his sons came to visit him, and he strengthened himself and sat up and kissed them. Now, Yahusuf was in perfect health. Moshe was. Asher, you'll see, will be, I believe, Zebulun. Yishikar or Naphtali, they're all in perfect health when they're passing away. But you can see here, Shimon was sick. Reuben got sick before he died. Other people have health ailments, and there's a reason for it. Both the things that we do in our life, foretelling what will happen with our posterity, there's a lot of things involved in it. But the scriptures say that and I believe it's in Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, that you should never judge a man Baruch until the day of his death. You see how he passes away. <clears throat> That's just something to consider there. But right here, even though they suffered, he died in sickness here, he was forgiven. He did not complain. He took what happened, enduring it with patience, right? Just like we all are supposed to endure. And he was an overcomer in that. But just things for you to consider here. So he strengthened himself, just like Jacob strengthened himself, an echo of what his father had done, right? And sat up and kissed them and said, Hearken, my children, to Shimon, your father. And I will declare unto you what things I have in my heart. I was born of Jacob as my father's second son. And my mother Leah called me Shimon. This is Simeon, right? 
you'll find that quite often in the Greek, when you have the al the iron, it'll turn it into an eo, right? But that was an iron wall. Right? Phoenix is another one that's paneach, but that was a, I believe there's an iron in there. It says because Yahuwah had heard her prayer. And that's what Shimon means to hear, right? To hear, believe, and do. Moreover, I became strong exceedingly. I shrank from no achievement, nor was I afraid of aught, for my heart was hard. And my liver was immovable, and my bowels without compassion. Because valor also has been given from the Most High to men, in inner being and body. For in the time of my youth I was jealous in many things of Yahusuf, because my father loved him beyond all. And I set my mind against him to destroy him, because the prince of deceit sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind. Now, remember... We don't have where the spirit of jealousy comes from in what we call the Bible. But it is mentioned in the book of Numbers that when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he's believing that his wife is committing adultery against him but has no proof, and then he gives the law the remedy for that, that it can be tried whether or not it is so to read to relieve his spirit of this feeling of that, that spirit of jealousy from him with the truth. But now you can see where it comes from. It says, so that I regarded him not as a brother, nor did I spare even Yaakov, my father, but his Elohim and the Elohim of his fathers sent forth his angel or messenger and delivered him out of my hands. For when I went to Shechem to bring ointment for the flocks and Reuben to Dotham, where, where were, were our necessaries and all our stores? Sorry about that. Yahuda, my brother, sold him to the Yishmaelim. And when Reuben heard these things, he was grieved for he desired to restore him to his father. But on hearing this, I was exceedingly wroth, angry against Yahuda, in that he let him go away alive. And for five months I continued wrathful against him. But Yahuwah restrained me and withheld from me the power of my hands. For my right hand was half withered for seven days. And we see this hand withering happen to Jeroboam later on, but it's restored. I believe there's also a type of that in Moshe with the, the leprous hand that, that is restored. I don't know if there's another one of those types. We have to remind me of it. Says, and I knew, my children, that because of Yahusuf, this had befallen me, and I repented and wept. And I besought Yahuwah Elohim that my hand might be restored, and that I might hold aloof from all pollution and envy, and from all folly. So you see, that's why it mentions in the Psalms, it was Tob that I was afflicted, that I might observe your law that I might learn your Torah, right? He corrects us, and then we, we repent and seek him. And then we, we, through fear of the judgment, hold to what is true. This is the condition that our men are in. This is why it says to discipline a child so that there is expectation, right? This is what he does with his own. For I knew that I had devised an evil thing before Yahuwah and Yaakov my father, on account of Yahusuf my brother, in that I envied him. And now, my children, hearken unto me, and beware of the spirit of deceit and, and of envy. For envy rules over the whole mind of a man, 
and suffers him neither to eat nor to drink, nor to do any tove or good thing. But it ever suggests to destroy him that, ha that he envies. And so long as he that is envied flourishes, he that envies fades away. Two years, therefore, I afflicted my soul with fasting in the fear of Yahuwah, and I learnt that deliverance from envy comes by the fear of Elohim. For if a man flee to Yahuwah, the evil spirit runs away from him, and his mind is lightened. This is explained in great detail by Kepha in the Recognitions of Clement. We actually covered this a few weeks ago about e the, uh, the video on evil spirits, if you re recall. The more we turn to the truth and to the to our ability to submit our will to the will of our maker and and conform ourselves to his word demons in that like respect will no longer be able to be in your presence they will flee from you and whatever remnant of evil you're still retaining in your mind or heart contrary to the things that are written that's that area or that avenue where that demon still has some remnant of influence in you. But if you perfectly repent, they perfectly flee. Right? And henceforward, he sympathizes with him whom he envied and agrees with those who love him and so ceases from his envy. And my father asked concerning me because he saw that I was sad. And I said unto him, I am pained in my liver, for I mourned more than they all, because I was guilty of selling, of the selling of Yahusif. And when we went down into Egypt, or Mizraim, and he bound me as a spy, I knew that I was suffering justly. He didn't complain about it. He didn't grumble. He took it and endured patiently, right? And I grieved not. Now, Yahusuf was a good man and had the Ruach of Elohim within him. Being compassionate and pitiful, he bore no malice against me, but loved me even as the rest of his brethren. Beware, therefore, my children, of all jealousy and envy, and walk in singleness of heart or singleness of soul and with a good heart, keeping in mind Yahusuf, your father's brother, that Elohim may give you also favor and esteem and baraka or blessing upon your heads, even as you saw in Yahusuf's case. Now, for Joseph is the English translation there, just like Joshua. But both of those take away Yahu, and Yahu is by his name Yah that he goes. It's mentioned throughout the scriptures. Yahu is literally the part that's removed from Yahushua's name quite often, and you can see it foreshadowed here and elsewhere. It was predominantly starting to be done after the Babylonian captivity, and they really fully committed to this by the Masoretic text. Um, the vowel points being added, if you will, around the 15th, uh, 15th or 16th century AD, 1500s. So even the Masoretic text, though, you can find the evidence for these. It's, it's spoken of in the full and defective spelling. You have the full spelling of words. And then you have the defective spelling of words in the modern Hebrew of the Masoretic text, where in one or two places in the in the whole of the Bible there, they'll have the full spelling of like Elohim with a wa, Aleph Lamed, wa, hey yod mem, and everywhere else that wa is missing, and they use the vowel points to have it said instead. Yahusuf's case, there's I think one place in the Psalms where it has the full spelling of Yahusuf and everywhere else it's like this though 
they really take away his name quite often. Joshua is another example where after the Babylonian captivity, Yahushua is now called Yeshua for no other reason than to remove Yahu. The reasons for that isn't so clearly stated in scripture, but you can find it in secular history a lot easier. And even today, we've mentioned it before, almost everyone knows what a Yahu is. It's not a good connotation, but that a Yahu is literally Yahuwah's name. So it's contrived by the world to be derogatory. Sorry about that. So continuing here. It says, all his days he reproached us not concerning this thing, but loved us even as his own inner being, and beyond his own sons esteemed us, and gave us riches and cattle and fruits. Do you also, my children, love each one his brother with a good or tove heart, and a ruach of envy will withdraw from you? For this makes savage the inner being, and destroys the body. It causes anger and war in the mind, and stirs up unto deeds of blood. And it leads the mind into frenzy, and suffers not prudence to act in men. Moreover, it takes away sleep, and causes tumult to the inner being, and trembling to the body. For even in sleep, some malicious jealousy, deluding him, gnaws, and with wicked spirits disturbs his inner being, and causes the body to be troubled, and wakes the mind from sleep in confusion. And as a wicked and poisonous spirit, so appears it to men. Therefore was Yahusif comely in appearance, and goodly to look upon, because no wickedness dwelt in him. For some of the trouble of the Ruach, the face manifests. And now, my children, make your hearts tov before Yahuwah, and your ways straight before men. And you shall find favor before Yahuwah and men. Beware, therefore, of fornication. For fornication is the mother of all evils. One of the things that a lot of people don't quite get is there's two types of all. There's the qualitative and the quantitative. The all is in all encompassing, and then the all is in all kinds of. In this capacity, fornication is the mother of all kinds of evils, not literally all evil. It wasn't fornication that had Adam eat the fruit. It wasn't fornication where Cain killed Abel. So it's not it's not literally true that it is literally all evils, but it is all kinds. And quite often, that's the mistake that's made. People take it to mean all of every one of them instead of all kinds or all types. The same thing is in money being the root of all kinds of evils, not literally all of them. But it says, for fornication is the mother of all kinds of evils, separating from Elohim and bringing near to Belial, which literally is a title for Satan. Belier is the Greek version of it, but it means without worth or worthlessness. For I have seen it inscribed in the writing of Hanok that your sons shall corrupt or shall be corrupted in fornication and shall do harm to the sons of Louis with the sword. But they shall not be able to withstand Louis, for he shall wage the war of Yahuwah, and shall conquer all your hosts. This actually was fully culminated, I believe, in the Maccabean period for the times of the children in the land, where you had whatever remnants of Simon or Shimon that were there after the return of the captivity, because if you remember of Louis and Simeon, they're not to have their own allotment, but to be scattered throughout. Shimon was generally within the tribe, the allotment of Yahuda there. 
meaning that those who hear, believe, and do will be within the number of those who confess, praise, and acknowledge Yahuda or Yahuwah. It's a type and picture in parable form. But they were spread throughout, and in the captivity, they went off with the northern kingdom. So they could have been, it would have generally been in both, possibly. But this, they'll tell you in the footnotes and elsewhere, during the Maccabean period, when you had apostates rise up and attack the, the priesthood, and that's when the Maccabeans were fighting to get them to be obedient again. Okay. There's quite a bit of that in here where you can see allusions to different periods, and especially because you can see so much for the Maccabean period or right before his advent, they believe that a lot of this was written at that time because they, the higher critics of scripture are generally atheistic and they don't believe in foretelling. They don't believe that anything that had stuff that was in it could be before those things actually happened. Look at the examples for what they say about when Daniel was written today. It was known that Daniel was written in the times before the Babylonian or during the Babylonian captivity. It was translated into Greek before the Roman Empire came to power. And those foretellings were known in two languages before they happened. They were partly while they were in the middle of happening, before beast reigning, right? But before the Roman Empire came to power, the fourth beast kingdom, if you will. A lot of that information is intentionally hidden if you guys haven't realized that right but that's why we went over i think it was a few weeks ago we took a segue and we went over the, what the what scripture says about the fourth beast and just covered all of the different sections about the fourth beast creature and how that is pointing to who rome is because once you get that picture down in your mind and you realize that his word is true you know well who's who's doing everything today it's easy to see the same one that's still responsible for everything until he returns. Proving it is also easy, but it's there's a lot of information there and it's actively hidden. That's what the whole counter reformation is about, right? Deception and destroying the reformation, which includes popular government. So right here, it says, and they shall be few in number, divided in Louis and Yahuda, and there shall be none of you for sovereignty or for the kingship, even as also our father foretold in his Baraka. Behold, I have told you all things that I may be acquitted of your sin. Now, if you remove from you your envy and all your stiff nakedness, as a rose shall my bones flourish in Yisrael, and as a lily my flesh in Yaakov, and my odor shall be as the odor of Lebanus or Lebanon, and as cedars shall set apart ones be multiplied from me forevermore, and their branches shall stretch afar off. Then shall perish the seed of Canaan, and a remnant shall not be unto Amalek. Now, remember, the seed of Canaan perishes when they're in unity. It was typified when Yahushua brought them in, right? That was a type and picture, but they didn't do it at that time. What the Canaanites do that make them abominable can be seen in the book of Yobelim, where they made the oath, they made a covenant, and they broke it. A covenant cannot be broken after it's established. That's what Scripture tells us. And when they do that, just like every example of that in Scripture, it never has a good ending. So they were given over to Satan because they did a thing that they ought not to. And then you can read in the Wisdom of Solomon or the Chokmah Shalomo about the things that they did that he found abominable and the reason why they were going to be utterly destroyed. Okay, Amalek is the son of Esau, Edom meaning Roman Catholicism, right? If you've been following along, that's covered in Gad the seer and what the fourth beast turns into. Right, And all the Capricodians shall perish, 
the this was in Anatolia or Turkey. Okay. And all the Hittites shall be utterly destroyed. Then shall fail the land of Ham. The, that would be Africa. And all the people shall perish. And then shall all the earth rest from trouble. And all the world under the Shamayim from war. Now, here's two different... This is restored and then this is a different manuscript, okay? We'll, we'll go ahead and cover them both. It says... Then the mighty one of Yisrael shall esteem Shem, for Yahuwah Elohim shall appear on earth and deliver the sons of men. And this one says, Then shall Shem, or Set, be esteemed, for Yahuwah our Elohim shall appear on earth as man, and himself saves again. So either way, you have both of these getting the idea that Yahuwah Elohim is going to appear on earth and we know that no one's seen the father but he's come in the father's name and we receive him not so this is just more and more confirmation to the fact that yahuwah yahushua was literally called by the name of yahuwah before he was born of in the in the flesh of miriam All right, so we'll continue. Now that's not saying he is his own father. That that the Trinity doctrine is a lie. He's not greater than his father, but he did inherit the name above every name, just like Scripture plainly says. We just don't believe these things because it's been muddied up. <clears throat> it says, Then shall all the spirits of deceit be given to be trodden underfoot, which is what happened where he gave us to trot under our feet the snakes and scorpions right and all the power of satan after he came and men shall rule over wicked spirits exactly what happened then shall i arise in joy and will barak the most high because of his marvelous works because elohim has taken a body and eaten with men and saved men now if you were to look in any of the writings anywhere to find where he got that information, you you won't see it directly. And there isn't a, a single one that I am aware of that directly tells you that he will come and eat with men. The only thing that we have is the example that Abraham lived through. You can read it right in Genesis where he saw Yahuwah with three men. One of them he calls Yahuwah. He bows to him. He worships him. He offers to wash their feet and does so, and he, he gives them a meal. Then later he's discuss, discoursing with him, and he sees the judgment is given from the Father to this Yahuwah on earth that is a man, and he administers it upon Sodom and Gomorrah in the five cities. That was explained by Irenaeus, who was the taught one of Polycarp, who was the taught one of Yahukanon, that because Abraham was a foreteller, he was being shown the, the truth that Yahuwah would appear as man to dwell, to converse and dine with him and wash, you know, to eat, converse, wash the feet and be given all judgment from the Father. So these are just more confirmations of these things. But this might help to see why it's not part of what we call the Bible and it was considered apocryphal and later removed and rejected by the Yahudim who rejected the truth. It says, And now, my children, obey Louis, those joined unto me, and Yahuda, right? The Kohen and the king. And be not lifted up against these two tribes, for from them shall arise unto you the deliverance of Elohim. And we've covered that before. It's known that... Yahushua comes from the line of Yahuda directly, but the, he's from the line of Louis by marriage is seen in the course of the scriptures, including in the Good News accounts where Elizabeth or Elisheba is a close relation to Miriam. Miriam's of the son of, of the lineage of Dawid, and Elisheba is of the sons of Aharon. So even there, there's close relation. It says, For Yahuwah shall raise up from Louis, as it were, a high Kohen, 
and from Yahuda, as it were a king, Elohim and man. And Yahuda was born on the 15th of the third month as the king, just like Yitzhak was born on the 15th of the third month as the fulfillment of the promised seed given to men. Every covenant, every covenant, every word ratified from the Almighty given to men was on the 15th of the third month, including the renewed covenant where his body is born again. This is also when, if you read in the text, I believe that is when Yahushua himself was born, the 15th of the third month. Right. And he shall deliver all the Gentiles and the race of Yisrael, all the nations, all of them that will turn to him, and the literal seed, which has always been the literal seed of Abraham and all those that sojourn with them. It was never always the DNA exclusive thing. Even in Abraham's time, he had all his servants and those with him circumcised and keeping the feasts. It says, therefore, I give you these commands that you also may command your children, that they may observe them throughout their generations. And when Shimon had made an end of commanding his sons, he slept with his fathers, being a hundred and twenty years old. And they laid him in a wooden coffin to take up his bones to Hebron, and they took them up secretly during a war of the Egyptians. For the bones of Yahusuf the Egyptians guarded in the tombs of the kings. For the magicians or sorcerers told them that on the departure of the bones of Yahusuf there should be throughout all the land darkness and gloom and an exceeding great plague to the Egyptians, so that even with a lamp a man should not recognize his brother. And we'll get into more of when that happened. Part of the chronologic, or the history that we don't see in the Bible is all the nuances of what is mentioned here. But after the deaths of the patriarchs, the it mentions in Yobelim that the king of Canaan fought against the king of Egypt and beat him. And he closed off the borders and he took over Egypt. He became the Pharaoh. And it was that Canaanite Pharaoh that did not know Yahusuf that inspired the people to um, enslave the children there. It was at that time during that war when Amram, the son of Kohath, the son of Louis, went into the land of Canaan with the bones of their forefathers, not only Shimon's here, but all of the other patriarchs that weren't buried there already. And he spent 40 years away from his wife, burying the dead. And then when, by the time he comes back, they're in captivity. The slavery has happened. He returns, I believe he's 110. But by the time he goes back to his wife, and then he has another 22 years or so before his own death and his children are born in that intermediate time. But either way, we'll go ahead and continue here. <clears throat> so, and the sons of Shimon bewailed their father, and they were in Egypt until the day of their departure by the hand of Moshe. Now, that's important. Because not all of them were. There's a there's a thing about the Malaysians being from Simon, and there's other writings from men that talk about it. When you look at the numbers in the lists of people from when they join, uh, when they leave Egypt and go into the wilderness to when they're leaving the wilderness to go into the land, Shimon's portion is significantly less than what it ought to be. And they're believing that at that time, a large section of them left and they had their own migrations before they ended up in Ireland, I believe, as part of the Malaysians. But that's a separate issue for looking into. There are writings about that beforehand, though. And you do have the history that we've covered where you have the sons of Zerah, the, the son of Yahuda from Tamar, who had his children leaving with migrating Hebrews before Moshe took them out. 
One example is the ancient history of Caldonia, where Dardanus left, the righteous remnant of the Hebrews left before the um, murders of the firstborn, and they founded the city of Troy. But even before that time, some of the sons of Zerah had already left with Hebrews to found other city-states, as we've mentioned before. Simon, however, is not said to be among them. So I believe that was it for there. Yep. That's all we have here, you guys. So um, we'll go ahead and do questions and answers now, see what we got going on. If you give me just one moment. All right. So that was the Testament of Shimon. The next in order chronologically is the Testament of Reuben. And seeing as we still have plenty of time, we're going to go ahead and read this one too. Now, Yahusuf lived to be 110 years old. Reuben or Shimon lived to be 120, but he died the same year. And then Reuben here lived, as you can see, two years later and died at 125. The math actually fits when you look at when both of them were born in the book of Yobelim and you add the numbers that are here, it, they both die the same year. But both of them are off by two years from when it says that Yahusuf should have died in the book of Jubilees or Yobelim. And if you remember, I, I still have to look into that, but it says 110 in the text and it shows 108 in the numbers. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this is the testament of Reuben, to behold the son, right? The firstborn son of Jacob and Leah. The copy of the testament of Reuben, even the commands which he gave his sons before he died in the 125th year of his life, two years after the death of Yahusuf, his brother. When Reuben fell ill, and this is another one who was sick, you can see, okay? Shimon is not easily distinguished as a nation because he was broken up and spread throughout, like Louis. But Reuben is generally regarded as France, as the nation that his tribe became outside of the land there. They would have also had providence over Canada until Ephraim, Britain, took over, and Britain got the birthright from Reuben, or I'm sorry, Yahusuf got the birthright from Reuben in reality by his father. You can see it playing out in the children in the nations like that with the providence and Canada being under the purview of Britain, right? Same thing with France for a while. How they went up into the bed of their father and the things going on and all that, it's prophetic for the things that were happening, what we call the dark ages, right? And if, if you look at the 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 history between france and rome or catholicism you'll see the parallels there fairly well this is this is before he died in the 125th year of his life two years after the death of yahusuf his brother when reuben fell ill his sons and his son's sons were gathered together to visit him and he said to them my children behold i am dying and go the way of my fathers. And seeing there Yahuda and Gad and Asher, his brethren, he said to them, Raise me up that I may tell to my brethren and to my children what things I have hidden in my heart. For behold, now at length I am passing away. And he arose and kissed them and said unto them, Hear my brethren, and do you my children. Give ear to Reuben your father in the commands which I give you. And behold, I call to witness against you this day, the El of Shamayim, that you walk not in the ignorance of youth and fornication, wherein I was poured out and defiled the bed of my father Yaakov. And I tell you that he smote me with a sore plague in my loins for seven months. And had not my father Yaakov prayed for me to Yahuwah, Yahuwah would have destroyed me. For I was thirty years old 
when I wrought the evil thing before Yahuwah. Now this is one of those inversions. Behold the son, the firstborn, and at 30, instead of redeeming his own bride, he defiles his father's wife, right? There, there's a picture there, but it's an inversion. It says, For I was 30 years old when I wrought the evil thing before Yahuwah, and for seven months I was sick unto death. And after this I repented with set purpose of my inner being for seven years before Yahuwah. Seven years. And wine and strong drink I drank not, meaning he fasted from alcohol, and flesh entered not into my mouth, and I ate no pleasant food, but I mourned over my sin, for it was great, such as has not been in Yisrael. So this is the first of many examples that you can see throughout Scripture here. The repentance and the affliction of your being, right, it is in abstaining from pleasurable foods, dainty meals, if you will. He survived on bread and water. And he did it for a, a week of years. The reason why this is significant is because in the ancient history of Caldonia, which is a literal history of a, this righteous remnant of Hebrews throughout time from their migration out of Egypt, from Troy to uh, Crete, from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to Gaul, and from Gaul to Man Trojan, or what became known as Montrose in Scotland. They lived there for almost a thousand years in Shalom, not having the, the problems of the world because they were keeping what they called the laws of the altar. And that was the, the instructions that they had from their forefathers until that time. Whenever any of them went apostate from the, the laws of the altar and they were repented of it, they had to show works of repentance, meet for repentance for seven years before they were accepted again as their established laws for how they were to function. That comes directly from right here. You don't find it anywhere else but from the Testament of Reuben, which gives legitimacy to these books that they're real because it's a separate writing completely than what we have here. And yet both are congruent with what they're telling you. And there's a lot more parallels with what you can find in the testaments here and the laws of the altar that they kept all throughout them. <clears throat> also with Yobelin, Hanok, and the other writings that predate the, the Torah, the ancient history of Caldonia makes it very clear that the Caldonians themselves, while a pious, righteous remnant of his people, kept safe for a very long time, they didn't even have the... Ten Commandments until they got the Renewed Covenant. They came together with them. Before that, they were only keeping what they called the laws of the altar. But we'd call it the common law, the same thing that the Britons were keeping in the southern part of the land there, the common law. It wasn't exactly the same because they were two separate peoples by then, keeping two different histories, came out or came to that area in two different ways over generations. That's a, a separate story that we've covered lightly in a few uh, ways before already in previous videos. But you can track it with the histories of them, the, the secular writings or the historical writings of the people themselves, the ancient history of Caledonia, the ancient line of the British kings. That's a Welsh writing that starts with Brutus from... Um, the lost Trojans from Brutus coming from Italy, right? It's a separate sect of Trojans, though, that was not the righteous remnant. Either way. <clears throat> it says, And now hear me, my children, what things I saw concerning the seven spirits of deceit when I repented. Seven spirits, therefore, are appointed against man, and they are the leaders in the works of youth. And seven other spirits are given to him at his creation, that through them should be done every work of man. 
and this is there's a lot of writings about where this might come from uh parallels and different things i don't want to get too much into all of those what i would suggest that we all do is you can look into that if you'd like to but we're not told to dig into the opinions of men but to prove the text for itself based off of what he gave us a criteria for and I'd, I'd encourage you guys to look at that. I know there are seven Ruach Oath that are from Yahuwah, and the enemy does like to to kill, steal, and destroy. He, he fakes things. He mimics and copies, but it's always a perversion. However, I don't know of any other place that directly mentions seven spirits specifically or anything of this nature. So it says, the first is the spirit of life, with which the constitution is created. The second is the sense of sight. And these are the first seven spirits through which all things are done, right? With which arises desire. The third is the sense of hearing, with which comes teaching. The fourth is the sense of smell, with which tastes are given to draw air and breath. The fifth is the power of speech, with which comes knowledge. The sixth is the sense of taste, with which comes the eating of meats and drinks. And by it strength is produced, for in food is the foundation of strength. The seventh is the power of procreation, and sexual intercourse, with which through love of pleasure, sins enter in. Wherefore it is the last in order of creation, and the first in that of youth, because it is filled with ignorance and leads the youth as a blind man to a pit, and as a beast to a precipice. Besides all these things, there is... Or besides all these, there is an eighth spirit or ruach of sleep with which is brought about the trance of nature and the image of death. With these spirits are mingled the spirits of error. First, the spirit of fornication is seated in the nature and in the senses. The, so... Now, the spirit of fornication is seated in the nature. It's in everyone's nature to have sexual attraction to the opposite sex. It's a carnal thing that happens. It doesn't matter if it's your wife or another. It's a, it's a nature. It's called an animal instinct, they call it. right? It's the reasonable mind that determines, well, it's my wife alone I'm going to be affectionate towards. Okay, that, That's the difference there. So that would be in the senses, right? The second, the spirit of insatiableness in the belly. The third, the spirit of fighting in the liver and gall. The fourth is the spirit of obsequiousness, and that's um, and chinsery. This is being a brown noser, okay? A sycophant, if you will. That through of facious attention one may be fair in seeming. The fifth is the spirit of pride, that one may be boastful and arrogant. The sixth is the spirit of lying, in perdition and in jealousy, to practice deceits and concealments from kindred and friends. The seventh is the spirit of injustice or inequity. The, unequity, right? With which are thefts and acts of rapacity, that a man may fulfill the desire of his heart. For injustice works together with the other spirits by the taking of gifts. And with all these, the ruach or spirit of sleep is joined, which is of error and fantasy. And so perishes every young man, darkening his mind from the truth and not comprehending the law of Elohim, nor obeying the admonitions of his fathers, as befell me also in my youth. So you remember idolatry 
causes spiritual blindness. Idolatry is synonymous with adultery. The, the fornication there too. And these are what he's alluding to. These things are, it's spiritual. It's how that happens is because of demonic jurisdiction that we give by the things we choose to do. Whether it's what we choose to think on, what we choose to say, or what we choose to physically do, right? And now, my children, love the truth, and it will preserve you. Hear you the words of Reuben, your father. Pay no heed to the face of a woman. <clears throat> nor associate with another man's wife, nor meddle with affairs of womankind. For had I not seen Bilhah bathing in a covered place, I had not fallen into this great inequity. For my mind, taking in the thought of the woman's nakedness, suffered me not to sleep until I had wrought the abominable thing. For while Jacob, our father, had gone to Yitzach, his father, when we were in Eder, or Edar, ya yeah, near to Ephrath, in Bethlehem, or Bethlehem, Bilhah became drunk and was asleep uncovered in her chamber. And having therefore gone in and beheld her nakedness, I wrought the impiety without her perceiving it, and leaving her sleeping, I departed. And forthwith a messenger of Elohim revealed to my father concerning my impiety, and he came and mourned over me, and touched her no more. Now, the exact way that this happened is given a little differently in the book of Yobelim and, and Bereshit. If there's any discrepancies here, it really has to be looked at whether or not it's an intentional error or if it's been kind of muddied down with the translation. A lot of things might seem to be an error that are agreeing with each other. They just don't state it in the same way. And other things are just generally different. We have to discern between the two. Sometimes it can be different, but it's not because it was wrong to begin with, but because it's been tampered with. That kind of thing we can't know for sure. And that's why we should not just look for one or two things that are wrong with a book and toss the whole thing out. When um, we get to, the, if you ever want to, not on the Sabbath, but generally outside of it, we'll, we'll study the book of Jasher, if you will, and you'll see it's not just one or two things. It's consistently over and over again. It is riddled with things that are in error with other writings, and it cannot be reconciled. But that that's an exception. Most of these writings are not like that. They might have a, a hiccup here or there because it was intentionally done, but they otherwise are seamlessly integrated. All right, so to continue... It says, pay no heed, therefore, my children, to the beauty of women, nor set your mind on their affairs, but walk in singleness of heart in the fear of Yahuwah, and expend labor on tov works, and on study, and on your flocks. And tell Yahuwah, give you a wife whom he will, that you suffer not as I did. For until my father's death I had not boldness to look in his face, or to speak to any of my brethren, because of the reproach. Even until now, my conscience causes me anguish on account of my impiety. And yet, my father comforted me much and prayed for me. Now, I want you to look at his disposition. He was already forgiven, but even then his conscience, he, he was still humbled. He was still in a lowly position after this, which is favorable to our maker. It's being bold and self-confident that causes us problems. It says, Me unto Yahuwah, that the anger of Yahuwah might pass from me, even as Yahuwah showed. And thenceforth, until now, I have been on my guard and sinned not. Therefore, my children, I say unto you, observe all things whatsoever I command you, and you shall not sin. 
were a pit unto the inner being is the sin of fornication, separating it from Elohim and bringing it near to idols. Here's another witness of that. He makes this allusion himself, and then in the Shepherd of Hermas, he makes it very clear what he says in the Renewed Covenant, that after he came, he's no longer allowing divorce, but if a, someone is in adultery, you separate from them until they repent, and if they repent, you bring them back. But if you were to marry another, you yourself are committing adultery. The same thing is true with idolatry. You're not supposed to keep someone who's worshiping idols in your in as your your love mate, your spouse there. It is adultery, and you're to put them away until they repent. That's literally what he says to do. And here's another witness. Here's another example of that. You can find these illusions. Psalm 115 and Psalm 135, it explains that idolatry leads to blindness. And just like he was covering before, the fornication also causes spiritual blindness. It's the same thing. Because it deceives the mind and comprehension and leads down young men into Hades or the grave before their time. For many has fornication destroyed. Because though a man be old, sorry about that. I don't know if you can hear. I don't know if you can hear the shots going off, but I, I closed my window. It says, for many his fornication destroyed, because though a man be old or noble or rich or poor, he brings reproach upon himself with the sons of men and derision with Belial, or worthlessness. For hear you regarding Yahusuf, how he guarded himself from a woman, and purged his thoughts from all fornication, and found favor in the sight of Elohim and men. For the Egyptian woman did many things unto him, and summoned magicians, and offered him love potions. But the purpose of his inner being admitted no evil desire. Therefore the El of your fathers delivered him from every evil, hidden death. For if fornication overcomes not your mind, neither can worthlessness overcome you. For evil are women, my children. Now, this isn't meaning all women, okay? This is talking about the phenomenon that we have to deal with. One thing that people don't quite comprehend, and I'd like to clear up, as a wife is to be to her husband, so is a man to be towards his maker. Right? That's And as we reap, or as we sow, so we shall reap. There's a picture here. But the deceptive, wily woman, what you can say Roman Catholicism is the culmination of, is what's being spoken of in all of these foreshadows. It's typified in a literal prostitute or a woman like Jezebel, but spiritually, it's Roman Catholicism. And I'm willing, these things will make more sense as you go. A few weeks ago, when we were doing our reading and we were covering, I believe it was about the uh, fourth beast, we read the section from Te Taffy, where Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, or told to Julius of the Julius clan from which the Caesars came, what would happen during the time where he, his people would come to power and how he would be given to reign during the watch of the night. And in that reign, he would have the wiles of a woman coming to reign as well. So it's, it's all foretold. Everything that we can see that happens in history, he's literally spoken of somewhere. And we can find the proof of it, which we've, we've been trying to do. But a lot of people see this, and it's not just bashing women. But the things that a woman can do here are evident. And I, you can see it more and more today, especially after the feminism and the, uh, the efforts behind that. <clears throat> Again, part of the counter-reformation to destroy popular government, common law, and everything contrary 
to Satan's will. This is for evil or women, my children, and since they have no power or strength over man, they use wiles by outward attractions that they may draw him to themselves. And whom they cannot bewitch by outward attractions, him they overcome by craft. For moreover, concerning them, the messenger of Yahuwah told me and taught me that women are overcome by the spirit of fornication more than men, and in their heart they plot against men, and by means of their adornment they deceive first their minds, and by the glance of the eye instill the poison, and then through the accomplishment, or the accomplished act, they take them captive. For a woman cannot force a man openly, but by a harlot's bearing she beguiles him. You can see this in the, the wrong woman of Proverbs and then Jezebel with the painting of her eyelids and whatnot. Another example of it is in Josephus's writing or Yahusuf's writings, the Antiquities of the Yahudim, where he goes over Cleopatra and how she literally would bewitch people like Mark Anthony and what happens with all that tragedy. Flee, therefore, fornication, my children, and command your wives and your daughters that they adorn not their heads and faces to deceive the mind. Because every woman who uses these wiles has been reserved for eternal punishment. That means if you change your face, and this is mentioned in the Apostolic Constitutions as well, and men are not excluded. It's said very clearly that a man modestly diminish the beauty that's been given to you by nature and your Elohim so that you don't cause women to lust after you. Because if something that you do causes another to, to desire you, you will incur a woe for it. Whatever your responsibility in that is, you will be corrected for. And that's true for a woman just as it is, just as it is for a man. The problem with the man is that it is the man's responsibility over a woman. And so you, a husband will suffer for the wife's choices if he lets her loose. Or his children. These are facts that are in his word. This is why we have to pay attention to these things. And that's exactly what you see as an example in the shepherd of Hermas, where Hermas himself was being corrected and having sin brought up in his life, just like Dawid was incurring sin, was enticed to sin by Satan because the children went astray and he numbered everybody contrary to the word and brought a plague. In the same way, a man will be led astray for what his house is doing. Something to keep in mind. These things literally happen. It is the way reality functions. It says, For thus they allured the watchers who were before the flood. For as these continually beheld them, they lusted after them, and they conceived the act in their mind, for they changed themselves into the shape of men, and appeared to them when they were with their husbands. And that was the first, you know, was the first allusion to horses in any capacity, but it was a physical that would later teach a spiritual kind of thing. I don't want to get too much into that beyond that point. It says, And the women lusting in their minds after their forms gave birth to giants, for the watchers appeared to them as reaching even unto heaven. Beware, therefore, of fornication, and if you desire to be pure in mind, guard your senses from every woman. That means your eyes, your ears, your nose, okay, your 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 touch. You guard your senses from them, and you won't you'll have a pure mind. It's very, it's very simple. If you really want to get into some amazing details about some things, I highly encourage you to read the two letters on virginity from Clement of Rome, the same one that wrote the apostolic constitutions as they dictated it to him. He's the same one that made copies of the shepherd of Hermas to publish them. He's the one that wrote the recognitions of Clement as he went with Kepha, and Kepha was doing his preaching, he wrote them and he sent them to Yaakov 
the overseer of the Yarushalayim assembly. So he was, a, it was given to him to be a prolific writer and like that. But um, my point is these, these things all agree. And in the letters of virginity, it talks about many things that if you want to be a virgin, a eunuch for the kingdom, as mentioned by Yahushua, as given for those to whom it is given, and it's mentioned in Yeshayahu or Isaiah and the wisdom of Solomon, Hok Meshalomo, as being your reward is going to be as a pillar or greater than a, a, a furniture in his eternal temple, his dwelling place in the, in the heavens. The letters on virginity go into detail about that. You get the hundredfold reward if you give your life to our maker and you don't seek to have a wife or children, but you you choose to serve him like Yahushua did, like Eliyahu did, like Yahukanon the Immerser, like Ignatius of Antioch, Shaul of Tarsus, and um, Barnabas, if you will. Many men chose to become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom, and it was known to them, it's explained by Irenaeus and others, that those... and in the letters on virginity, that they get the hundredfold reward when they're made like messengers, their dwelling place, as as with Hanok, who, who mentions it in the in the book of First Enoch, their reward will be in the heavens, in the Shamayim, like the messengers of the presence before his face, singing praises all the time. That's the hundredfold reward. The 60-fold reward would be in the Garden of Eden or in the city, and the 30-fold would be in the Garden, if I remember that's the proper order. <clears throat> but either way, in the Letters of Virginity, with that in mind, he tells you a whole bunch of rules about things to do, about not associating with women, not having even the pretext of evil being mentioned in regard to you. And if... Those things were, if you read about it, it'll break your heart because it's something that's intentionally not done. The contrary is actively not done in our country today. And you, and it's been done since the 60s and you can really see the, the chaos and the fornication, the evil that has come from it. Quite literally, a disaster that's in the making. All right. And he says, and command the women likewise not to associate with men that they also may be pure in mind. For constant meetings, even though the unrighteous deed is not wrought, are to them an irredeemable, irre irremediable disease, rather. It's a disease without remedy, okay? And to us, a destruction of worthlessness and an eternal reproach. For in fornication there is neither comprehension nor righteousness, and all jealousy dwells in the lust thereof. Excuse me. Therefore then I say unto you, you will be jealous against the sons of Louis, and will seek to be exalted over them. But you shall not be able, for Elohim will avenge them, and you shall die by an evil death. For to Louis... And if you don't know what happened with the papacy being conquered and taken into France for a while and all that, and then the uh, French Revolution, unlike the American Revolution where we held our creator as supreme and all men equal, the French Revolution was atheistic. It was an atheistic institution that has not helped them or benefited them very much at all. Right here it says, For to Louis, Elohim gave the sovereignty, and to Yahuda with him, and to me also, and to Dan, and to Yahusuf, that we should be for rulers. Now this part is in brackets, and you can see it's kind of messed up here, but um, that's something we can go over more later. The idea of the birthright and how it was handed down, the ultimate, the, the greatest gift was given to Louis. The one who freely, of his own volition, wanted to serve his maker. He got he got the good portion, the first fruits of everything, he, to, to serve his maker and not have any other concerns in the world. That was given to him. But the kingdom, the earthly 
birthright was given to Yahuda, and then the actual birthright Baraka, if you will, that should have been Rubens, including the kingship, but that was separated, including the Kahuna, but that was separated. The rest of the birthright went to Yahusuf, which was passed to his two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. We'll see that more in the course of time as well. This is therefore I command you to hearken to Louis, because he shall know the law of Yahuwah, and shall give ordinances for judgment, and shall sacrifice for all Yisrael until the consummation of the times. And even in the consummation of the times, you have the sons of Louis, the sons of Zadok, offering during the millennial reign. Not, not to do sacrifices for the sake of sacrifices. Those are, those are not to be instituted anymore. But if you're following along, we're going to have people that are still mortal throughout the millennial reign. They'll live a lot longer than we currently do. But they won't be changed like the messengers, those that are of the first resurrection, the, the second death has no more power over them. The ones that are still alive at that time are going to be like the Canaanites that repented and made a covenant with Yahushua when they came into the land. And they became the woodcutters and the water gatherers and the servants. Those are the ones that you'll be ruling over as kings and Kohanim during that time. So the, it, there's a whole bunch more to it than that. But until the consummation of the times, the sons of Louis are still doing that. Even today, it's been given for the sons of Louis without question to be able to be partakers as emissaries or evangelists or teachers or whatever in the renewed covenant because the gifts of Elohim are not to be repented of. You can find a perfect example of that with the Kohanim that turned to the truth in the book of Acts and, and the commission with um, Barnabas. He was a son of Louis from Crete, sold his possessions, laid it at the feet of the emissaries, and then he became one and went out and started preaching. Same thing. I'm just trying to show you these things are consistent. It, it's, not, it's not disagreeable with the truth. It goes along with it. If we could only see these things. But right here, this is, therefore I command you to hearken to Louis because he shall know the law or Torah of Yahuwah and shall give ordinances for judgment and shall sacrifice for all Yisrael until the consummation of the times as the anointed high Kohen of whom Yahuwah spake. I adjure you by the Elohim of Shemaim to do truth each one unto his neighbor and to entertain love each for his brother, and draw you near to Louis in humbleness of heart, that you may receive a baraka or blessing from his mouth. For he shall barak Yisrael and Yahuda, because him has Yahuwah chosen to be king over all the nation, and bow down before his seed, for on behalf of it, will die in wars visible and invisible, and will be among you an eternal king. Now, they'll talk about this explaining the Maccabean period, but if you remember, the Maccabeans were sons of Louis that were intermarried with sons of Yahuda, and they were reigning because they had the line of Yahuda from their maternal line, a type of things that would happen later on in a larger scale too, that's different. That's for a later time. It says, And Reuben died, having given these commands to his sons, and they placed him in a coffin until they carried him up from Egypt and buried him in Hebron, in the cave where his father was. All right. And that's part of the, um, the higher criticism. They talk about how these things were achieved in the land with the prince priests in the departments of the temporal and spiritual sovereignty during the Maccabean period, how they were re rising up against them and they were humbled by them, right? But Reuben wasn't there. Reuben was of the northern kingdom and already gone. 
So that can't be literally of Reuben, except for the remnants that might have been there that returned. And then the fuller culmination is during the Dark Ages. But thank you all for your time. I hope this was edifying for everyone. And uh, we will talk to you next week. You have a great Shabbat Shalom, a great Shavuot Tov, and we'll see you then.